Hello, ladies and gentlemen. The Ram Temple in Ayodhya is probably the most evocative issue that has shaped politics for over three decades now. Even the 1990s, the Ram Janmabhoomi agitation mobilized public opinion across the country, mainly in the north and west of India. The construction of the temple, its pran pratishta in January this year, has become a focal point of the 2024 Lok Sabha campaign. Joining us now is Amish Tripathi, a renowned Indian author known for his reinterpretation and retelling of Indian mythology and history, somebody whose books we have all read and enjoyed. He recently released his documentary, Ram Janmabhoomi, The Return of a Splendid Son. That's a must watch. He's here to chat with us today. Thank you, Mr. Tripathi, for uh, speaking uh, to NDTV. Your documentary explores the sequence of the events that unfolded in Ayodhya, culminating into the Pran Pratishta that happened on the 22nd of January. One of the speakers in your documentary I was watching very casually says, Ram Dukh Mein Hai, Ram Sukh Mein Hai, from Hai Ram to Hey Ram to Shri Ram. You know, that makes one understand how the Ram Temple is not just about the deity, but about the devotion. Next week, it will be Ram Navmi, the first Ram Navmi after Pranpadesha ceremony. How do you see the temple, the narrative around Ayodhya and also the story of Ram gaining dominance in public discourse in the coming days? Uh, uh, first of all, thank you for having me here. Uh, look, the way I see it, uh, Lord Ram is India's eternal king. Uh, he is, of course, worshipped as, as a god. Uh, but uh, throughout history, uh, for, hundred, for centuries, indeed millennia, uh, kings and queens have drawn inspiration from Ram Rajya. Uh, the Guptas, uh, you know, spoke of, uh, you know, and wrote of their inspiration from the principles of Ram Rajya. Dynasties in the south, the Ikshvakus, for example, as I'm sure you're aware, the founder of Lord Ram's clan was Lord Ikshvaku. The Ikshvakus were essentially an Andhra dynasty. They spoke of how they were inspired by Lord Ram and how they ruled. Uh, the Rayas of Vijayanagar, uh, you know, if you go to Hampi, uh, uh, apparently the birthplace of Lord Hanuman is actually right next to Hampi. Uh, and uh, the Rayas wrote again of how they were inspired by Lord Ram. In that sense, I think, uh, you know, across India and through the ages, Lord Ram's uh, way of life and more particularly the way he ran his kingdom uh, has always been held up to be the ideal way governance uh, should be done. Which is why even Mahatma Gandhi so many millennia uh, after Lord Ram, uh, when he wanted to uh, rouse Indian people together for uh, uh, the independence movement, he spoke of the concept of Ram Rajya. Because regardless of the region you come from, the religion you practice, whatever community you're from, usually across India, most people have seen Ram Rajya as the ideal way to mm. run a state. Right. Uh, I mean, you know, during the Pran Pratishta ceremony, one thing that struck out was the Prime Minister saying, Ram Urja hai, Ram Samadhan hai, meaning that Ram is energy, Ram is also resolution, not conflict. When you were shooting your documentary and you have, in, have a lot of voices in there, did you find resonance of what the Prime Minister said with common Indians? Oh, absolutely. You know, and in that sense, the, the, the documentary was, in, I, in my background, to be honest, I have read many of the versions of the Ramayana, my my uh, learning of it has been more from the textual uh, sources. Uh, but this documentary helped me learn from uh, what are the folk tradition sources, right? Uh, there is the Shastra and there is the Rudir, the, you know, the folk traditions, the common people, how they see uh, Lord Rama. And that was fascinating. Uh, Hindus across all castes, their fascination with, with Lord Ram, scheduled tribes, uh, backward caste, upper caste, all of them, right? Uh, Indian Muslims, we found a group of Manganyar Muslims uh, in Ayodhya. They are Namazi Muslims from Rajasthan. Hmm. But their vocation is they sing devotional bhajans to Lord Ram in honor of, uh, in honor of Lord Ram. We've, in fact, we recorded some of them and uh, put that up uh, in the documentary. It, it's fascinating how uh, the ideals of Ram really seem to unite different strands. And one thing very interesting is all of them see Ram from their own perspective. You know, there's this lovely group, uh, uh, you know, called, in, in, uh, they're there in Ayodhya, uh, Ram Rasiks. Hmm. They are men who cross-dress as women, hmm. right? Uh, and they worship Lord Ram, assuming that they are from the side of Sita Ma. Okay. You know, in a way, Lord Ram is like their Jijaji, hmm. right? Uh, and it's it's such a beautiful way and various different ways to see Lord Ram. It's very inclusive. Right. That's it. 
I mean, you know, as somebody who has written the Ramchandra series, when you see Ram being, you know, so politically uh, potent, what are your mm. feelings? Because, you know, you've remained apolitical, like, you know, I don't, I don't see you in the political sphere, though you've been in the public sphere for so long. I also mm. wanted to ask you, what does it mean now to say I'm a proud Hindu or for that matter, even a proud Hindu, because religion largely is being seen in the political realm these days? Look, I mean, the reality is every Indian is political. <laughs> all of us think of politics all the time. But many of us may not have the skills to speak on politics. Politics in India is extremely complicated. And politics by its very nature, as it should be, tends to look at things more from a short-term uh, uh, perspective. Because every politician, and I have respect for Indian politicians across all uh, uh, parties. It's not easy being an Indian politician. But they will obviously be worried about the next election. It's the nature of, 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 of that area. Uh, but there are some of us who may still look at politics or how society moves. But our time frame may be longer. Hmm. We won't be looking only up to the next elections. We'd be exploring what would things be like 15 years later, 20 years uh, uh, later. There is, of course, a political thing on both sides. But the way I see it, from a longer term perspective, from a 15, 20, 25 year perspective, the fact that Indians are getting more connected to their roots, the fact that we look at the principles of Lord Ram on how a state should be governed, these are actually very good things. Okay. Uh, if we explore Yog Vashisht, if we explore the various versions of the Ramayana, something as simple as how tax, you know, taxation has been discussed, by the way, hmm. in some versions of the Ramayana, you learn many things of what our ancestors thought hmm. a society should be structured. And there's a lot to learn from that. I think many of our modern day theories are based on Western concepts. This entire thing of left and right also, hmm. right? This is actually a Western construct. It makes no sense in India, yeah. frankly. Uh, in India, economically, everyone is left wing, hmm. let's be honest, yeah. right? Uh, we have to see the Indian paradigm and reconnecting to Lord Ram and his story will help us. Right. Uh Amish, I also wanted to ask you about this uh, book on idol worshipping because, you know, when, when the Ram Temple, uh, the Pran Pratishta happened, a lot of discussion, conversation was around how the deity looks, you know, look at the eyes, it's, it's uh, uh, you know, it's uh, Shamal Rang and, you know, look at the Ajanu Bhav. So I was wanting to ask you, um, you know, as somebody who has written, or written about this, what was your experience about the Darshan and also how do you see uh, us addressing this debate around uh, idol worshipping, which is actually a global debate right now? So two things. One is uh, Lord Ram being dark-skinned. He has been described that way in uh, the Valmiki Ramayana and practically all versions of uh, of the Ramayana. Even the famous hymn, Raghupati Raghav Raja Ram, if you remember that line, Sundar Vigraha Megha Sham. Yeah. Right? Uh, so he is uh, dark-skinned. So in that sense, the Murti, the Vigraha uh, is actually correct. Uh, that is the way he's been described. It's Lord Shiva who's uh, fair-skinned. Hmm. Uh, uh, so, uh, Lord Ram, Lord Krishna are actually dark skit. That's the way they're described in our text. Now, in terms of idols, in terms of murtis, uh, I'm a very proud idol worshipper. I'm not judging those who reject uh, idols. Hmm. Uh, but the philosophical, and we, in fact, my sister and I, we came out with a book called Idols, explaining the philosophies of idols. And many of us Indians, we are actually among the last surviving idol worshipping cultures uh, in the world. The rest were all killed, frankly. Uh, there is something intuitively liberal in idol worshipping because at the heart of the, of the philosophy of idol worshipping is that I see the divine in everything. The heart, the, at the heart of the philosophy of idol rejecting is that the universe itself is profane and God is a male outside of it. God is particularly a male God and he's outside of the universe. The universe is not uh, divine by itself. There's a difference between the creator and the creation. But in the idol worshipping way, the creator and the creation are both divine. Hmm. That's why we see divinity in everything. In the rivers, in the mountains, in the trees, in the murti that we worship, in you and me. Hmm. The word namaste means I bow to the divine within you. Hmm. And I find this intuitively liberal, hmm. which is why I'm a proud idol worshipper. Uh, and my sister and I, we've written a book explaining the philosophy behind idol worship. Right. 
Amish, you know, one of my favorite works of yours has been the way you have used hyperlinked multilinear narratives, telling separately the stories of Ram and Sita as part of your Ramchandra series, because your Sita is not an obedient princess. She's a traveler. She's a warrior. Can we see the same magic in your retelling of stories from the Chola Empire? Because, you know, the story of Kundavai and Karikalan also need to reach a wider audience. Absolutely. You know, I couldn't agree more. You know, one of the problems with the way our history texts have been approached, not just in our textbooks, but even the way the stories are, are told, there's this obsession with Delhi, right? Uh, all our history books are all just centered around Delhi and usually around male rulers of Delhi, mm. right? Uh, and I'm not deriding the importance of Delhi. Delhi is important, but there are other parts of India too, Eastern India, much of, you know, beyond east of Kanpur, Gujarat, Maharashtra, South, they've all been ignored. Hmm. And it's not just these regions, but even female rulers have been ignored. Hmm. We had rulers who ruled in their own name. Uh, you know, in India, Rani Prabhavati, uh, Gupta, Rani Rudrama Devi. Uh, we had women who founded universities, by the way, in ancient India. So there's not some mythological or something, it's actual history, right? Hmm. Uh, and it's from the historical age. There are texts for it. Balabi University, for example, was founded by a woman. Hmm. We need to bring out many of these uh, uh, these forgotten heroes and heroines hmm. because we'll we'll understand our country a little better. Right. Because our history is so Delhi and Northwest India focused, we see ourselves as primarily an agrarian hmm. and a male-oriented society, right? And which essentially kept fighting invad invaders from Northwest. Hmm. That's not what our actual story is. We were, uh, if you look at the rest of India, hmm. we were a great seafaring nation. Hmm. We had great women rulers. We had women scientists. Yeah. We had women rishis. We had the equivalent of women prophets and messiahs, including from uh, Tamil Nadu, as right. you just said. Right. These, all these stories need to come out. We'll get a more holistic understanding of India. Right. Amish, my last question to you. Many feel that this delving into past might also, you know, uh, will, will have repercussions, you know, for the way we see history on the reconciliation and healing efforts. Many feel that this would also deepen fault lines as India as a nation country, it has seen a lot, borne a lot, and it's time to focus on the present and future. Many others feel that this will make us more conscious of our past, help us repeat mistakes. How do you see the last 10 years in terms of how we see uh, our own history, our own past, and what more needs to be done? You know, uh, there are various ways to approach history, uh, particularly countries that have had troubled histories. We've suffered invasions. We've suffered brutal invasions for a thousand years. Um, I think one of the mistakes that our uh, establishment historians made was uh, they called what was the Turkic colonial rule the Islamic invasion. We don't call the British colonial rule the Christian invasion, right? Uh, at a Mass level Indians are very clear the British colonial rule had nothing to do with Indian Christians. Mm. But we are not as clear that the Turkic colonial rule had nothing to do with Indian Muslims. In fact, the Indian Muslims were as oppressed mm. as the Indian Hindus uh, at that time. Uh, the, uh, the Turkic rulers did not speak Urdu. Mm. They spoke Turkic mm. or Persian. Right? We won't understand anything of what they were saying. Mm. They did not look like Ranveer Singh or Prithviraj Kapoor. Mm. Uh, to us, they would have looked Chinese, though they weren't Chinese. They were from Central Asia. The Turks were essentially a Central Asian tribe mm. uh, the, from the steppe lands, which extends from Europe to uh, Eastern, Eastern Asia. If we get a better understanding of our history, we'll be better prepared. The history won't poison our present, right? Mm. Um, just forgetting or trying to be nihilistic about what happened in the past, then what happens is actually uh, the poison goes deeper mm. uh, and it comes out in frankly negative ways. Yeah. Uh, it's better to just face the sunlight is the best disinfectant. Truth sets you free. Mm. Speak the truth of what happened, but realize it has nothing to do with people today. Um, and in fact, that's a much better way. It, it's what's been done in South Africa, for example. See the truth of what happened and then move on. Uh, and the past has to be presented in a calm, gentle manner. Mm. But the truth must be presented. Right. Thank you, Mish, for joining us with those details. History doesn't uh, poison our presence. So that's so beautifully said. Thank you so much for speaking to NDTV.